It's okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, my computer is working now. So just to not to have prepared the, the slide introduction uselessly, I just show it to you here. It's what I just said in my introduction, that the, the field that we are working in has four different legs. Foundation of quantum physics discussing uh, theoretical aspects of entanglement of locality and so on. Uh, you have also uh, uh, computation physics, inventing protocols and algorithms, making this useful for communication or computing. You have experimentally the manipulation and control of quantum system, whether they are artificial or natural. And the last one, which is again something theoretical, how can we understand decoherence and fight decoherence to make this system useful? And all this converge to what the physics of quantum computers, quantum simulators, quantum communication, and quantum technology. And what I will be talking to you today has to do with the uh, upper uh, right corner, manipulation of simple quantum system. I try to re remind you of the methods which are used to manipulate precisely individual quantum system, to prepare them and to study them in the lab. Uh, this started uh, as experiments which were trying to test quantum principles and it turned into a field which demonstrates now quantum information procedures. The systems which, uh, on which uh, we are working are very diverse. You have cold ions and neutral atoms. You have Rydberg atoms, very large atoms, which are very sensitive to microwaves and which are exploited for this property. You have also photons, either trapped in cavities or propagating along fibers. Uh, and in uh, condensed matter physics, you have artificial atoms, which are made of uh, superconducting circuits with Josephson uh, junctions, quantum dots, and so on. So it's a very wide domain, and we will see that the methods to study the system have very strong similarities. So I will review here methods to prepare quantum states, to measure and reconstruct them, especially discussing quantum non-demolition procedures, because we don't want to destroy the system that we are working, in, uh, working with, whether they are atoms or photons, and also say a few words about ways to control the evolution and this is something which you can call Hamiltonian engineering, how to, to devise uh, evolution procedures which are controlled. Uh, the methods which are used for the system are largely uh, optical methods using lasers. This is for real systems. And uh, if you work in condensed matter physics, uh, lasers are no longer important, but the methods are inspired from quantum optics and microwaves very often replace what we do with lasers in atomic physics. So I will first describe a uh, simple quantum system and the tools we use to manipulate them. Then I will uh, turn to a very simple model, which uh, is very general, a single a two-level system is spin coupled to harmonic oscillator. And we'll see that it it covers a lot of this physics. Uh, then I will focus on the non-destructive measurements and uh, how you can study quantum jumps and, and, and uh, uh, whether you do it with atoms or, or, or electromagnetic fields have non-destructive ways of studying the system. I will say a few words uh, about uh, schrodinger cats superposition of uh, mesoscopic uh, systems. And uh, the last part I will uh, talk about uh, an experiment we did in Paris, the quantum Zeno dynamics of a Rydberg atom, how we, we can uh, use the quantum Zeno effect to uh, prepare non-classical states of an atom. And uh, this is, I will present this as an example of Hamiltonian engineering, and then I will conclude by trying to relate this talk to uh, other talks which will be given later in, in this workshop. So I will start by discussing simple quantum system, and you see here three pictures an ion trap on the left, a cavity QED set up in the middle, and a circuit QED set up using superconducting qubit in the right. And all that I will be saying will uh, be referring to this system, and I will take examples from these different kinds of physical systems. But I would like to start by reminding ourselves of the fact that the mother of all these methods was optical pumping. Optical pumping is a method to orient atoms in, in, a, in a gaseous sample, which were invented by Alfred Kessler back in the 1950s. And this was the first method 
to manipulate internal states of atoms and put atoms out of equilibrium in exotic situations. I remind you the principle of it, you have atoms that you can consider as two-level systems in, in, a, in a cell and you shine circularly polarized light on these atoms. In the ground state, the atoms have two uh, states corresponding to spin down and spin up and you have the same thing in the excited state. If you excite these atoms with circularly polarized light, the only transition which is allowed is the one which takes the atom from spin down in the lower state to spin up in the upper state. You have to flip the spin because of uh, angular momentum conservation. And once the atom is up, what it can do is either come back to the same state or come to the other state. And so you see that after one cycle, there is a probability that the atom has been transferred to the other state. And if it does not happen in the first cycle, after a few cycles, all the atoms will be in the state which can no longer absorb light. And so you will accumulate the atoms and you see that the atoms are now oriented and they are all end up in a state which has been later on called a dark state because this state cannot absorb uh, light anymore. Light is used to manipulate the state, but as you see, light is also used to detect. Because if you plot uh, the transmitted light or the fluorescent light as uh, the pumping uh, proceeds, you see that the pumping, the transmitted light increases because the system is no longer able to absorb, and the fluorescent light decreases because of the system is no longer able to, to scatter photons. And so you see that the light is used as a way not only to manipulate, but also to detect the system. And uh, what I want to say is that this optical pumping has introduced the basic ingredients of quantum state manipulation. Exchange of energy and momentum between light and matter used to prepare and to detect the quantum states. And these experiments were done with classical light in the 1950s. And so you had to manipulate huge numbers of atoms. But the lasers have increased the precision and sensitivity to the point where now these experiments are performed with a single particle. And on the next slide, I show you an historical picture. This is the first single ion detection by Peter Toshek back in 1978. So you see the laser light is scattered on the electrodes of the trap, but you see a very small spot in the middle, which is a, barium, a single barium ion which scatters light into a microscope. And from then on, experiments have been done with single particles. You see here uh, a, a chain of ions, uh, which I took from uh, Rainer Blatt's lab in Innsbruck. You see here that there are uh, tens of ions which can be controlled. And, and, and you see each ion is a bright spot. And the, the ion scatters a light when it is in the right level, uh, co corresponding to the laser transition. Otherwise, it is dark. And the way the ions are detected is exactly the same technique as in optical pumping. You see uh, a situation here where you have three levels, a transition between the S and P state, which is strongly loaded, and the laser is driving this transition with a very fast rate. And here, a very long metastable state. This transition is very weakly loaded, and these levels are very long lived. They constitute the levels of a qubit, if you do. Uh, quantum information or the levels of an atomic clock if you want to use this transition for a clock. And you see that if the atom is here in this state, it will scatter a lot of light into a detector because it will undergo the transition here and you see a bright spot. If the atom is by such some process, for instance, by absorbing a photon brought into this state, this state is no longer uh, absorbing light and you have a dark spot instead. And this is something which is very closely related to optical pumping. You see also uh, that uh, optical pumping intervenes in the process of cooling the atoms in an ion trap, for instance. You see here uh, an ion, a two-level ion. The blue uh, part corresponds to the ion in the lower state G. The red part, the atom, is in the excited state E. And in each of these states, the ion is trapped in a harmonic potential. And so you see that uh, in state e, G, the atoms can occupy the ground state or the first or uh, second or third diversional state. The same thing happens in, uh, in when the atom is in the other state. And we, if you shine a laser light, you see that the laser light can be either at the frequency of the atomic transition or at the frequency separated by plus or minus omega, where omega is a vibrational frequency. And these are called sidebands of the absorption process. If you uh, tune the laser on the right sideband, 
you see that the atom will absorb a photon and lose one quantum of vibration by doing that. And when the atom falls back to the ground state, the, the high, with the highest probability, it will fall back without changing the vibrational state. So you see that after one cycle, there is a high probability that the atom will have lost one vibration quantum. And if you go on, each cycle of absorption fluorescence decreases the phonon, phonon number, and the progress of the cooling is monitored by the decrease of the right sideband fluorescence, exactly like in the optical pumping I described before. And the atom ends up in the ground state of motion. And this is a technique which is used to prepare the atom, the ions in, in this state. And it's again an optical pumping process. Optical pumping is also used to uh, detect the single ion by using a quantum jump uh, observation. Again, you have the same energy diagram as the one I showed before, which uh, correspond to, to uh, a very a strongly allowed transition on one side and a weakly allowed transition on the other side. And you see that uh, if the atom is, is carried from the S to the D state, uh, the cycles of absorption fluorescence are interrupted suddenly and the level of fluorescence decreases, the quantum jump, which is revealed by the fact uh, that the fluorescence disappears. If uh, then uh, the atom is recycled into the upper state by using a laser going from D to P, the fluorescence light reappears suddenly. And the rate at which this occurs, uh, it depends upon the probability for the atom to be in the D state. So if, for instance, you uh, tune the frequency of the red laser and you record the rate at which these quantum jumps occur, you get a very narrow line. And this is a way to do spectroscopy on these very weakly low transitions. This can be done either in the context of quantum information or in the context of uh, uh, atomic clock spectroscopy. So in this case, you see that the, the photons are the disposable elements, you, you scatter photons, and this is used for quantum number motion measurement of the atoms. The atoms, of course, are not destroyed. The atoms are still here after the, the cycles occur. And as I will show you in a moment, a symmetrical process use disposable atoms to count photons in a cavity by reversing the process, by using the atoms to get information about the feed. So uh, on, on this slide, I just summarize what I have just said, and these are slide is uh, taken from the poster which announced the Nobel Prize in 1912, in 2012, excuse me, which compares what is being done with ion traps on the left, where you see that ions are held by uh, a configuration of electrodes and laser light is used to cool them and to record them by their fluorescence. So the photons manipulate and measure the atoms and uh, in in our cavity experiment, it's the opposite. The photons are held in a trap, which is a good cavity, and atoms are sent across the trap to manipulate the photons and to extract information. So uh, these two experiments exchange the roles of matter and radiation. Uh, in one case, you manipulate non-destructively the atoms with photons, and in the other case, you manipulate non-destructively photons with atoms. And in the case of cavity experiments, we don't do it with just any kind of atom. We use special Rydberg atoms, which are very strongly coupled to microwaves. And for that, we need lasers, of course, to excite the atom into Rydberg states. And I will talk about that later. So the principle of this cavity QD experiment, uh, you have a very high Q cavity, which is made of two uh, mirrors, uh, niobium coated mirrors. And we send atoms, Rydberg atoms, which have two energy levels, which are relevant for the experiment. So I will talk about this. Uh, so we prepare these atoms later on. And in the cavity, we have a field oscillator containing 0, 1, 2, 3 photons. And atoms interact one after the other with the field in the box. Uh, the photons are trapped for a very long time, more than a tenth of a second in this box. And uh, what happens is that uh, a sequence of atoms crosses the cavity. and after the atom has crossed the cavity, it enters into a state selective detector. It's a condenser uh, across which we apply an electric field. And you see the electric field is lowering the energy barrier for the electrons to escape in the upper state and remain bounded in the lower state. So we have a state selective detection process. An electric field can be applied across the mirrors to tune by Stark effect 
the frequency of the transition so we can tune the atoms in and out of resonance. And if we want to prepare the atoms in superposition of state E and G, we use an auxiliary cavity in which a classical pulse of microwave prepares the superposition of the state that we want to prepare. So the qubit state is controlled by classical microwave applied before the atoms reach the cavity and another microwave can be applied afterwards to analyze the state. Uh, the same kind of experiment work in circuit QED and I just want to compare what is being done in solid state physics as compared as what we do in our case. In, in, in atomic physics, we use a transition between two Rydberg states, and these are circular Rydberg states, and I will talk to them more later on. The transition is in the gigahertz range, 50 gigahertz, and uh, these atoms have a, have a very large electric dipole because the electron and the, and the core are far away, so they have a very strong coupling with microwaves. The lifetime of this atom is rather long, in circuit QED, these atoms become artificial. You have a bit, the, the, the essential element is a junction. You have two superconductors separated by an uh, uh, insulating layer, and pairs of coupler pairs go from one side to the other. And the physical parameters which are important is the difference of number of coupler pairs on the right and the left, which I call N and delta, which is the phase, the difference between the quantum phase of the two, of the two islands. And uh, when you develop this physics, you find that N and D, N and delta are conjugate, quantum conjugate variables. And you can write a Hamiltonian for the system exactly like you write a Hamiltonian for the atom. And uh, there are many kind of uh, qubits done in this way, but you see here the kind typical uh, potential that you get in, for this Hamiltonian, the potential which is which is like a harmonic oscillator with nonlinearities, and the ground state, uh, this, this potential is here represented versus the phase difference between the, the phases in the two parts of the island. And you see that around equilibrium, you have the ground state and the first excited state, and the nonlinearity makes the transition between the zero and one state slightly different from the one from one to two, and so you can isolate by resonant methods a two-level system in this case, and you can tune this qubit by varying the magnetic flux across it exactly like you tune similarly to the way you tune the readback transition by applying an electric field. And you can also detect uh, these qubits by changing suddenly the flux exactly like you detect the readback atom by changing suddenly the electric field. What about the cavity? The cavity uh, in atomic cavity QED, the cavity are exceedingly good. They have a a Q factor exceeding 10 to the 10, very long lifetime for the photon inside, and you have to operate them at low temperature. In the case of circuit QED, the cavity can be either a coplanar uh, waveguide, which uh, uh, sustains a standing wave of radio frequency, and you insert the qubit either at the end or in the middle of this uh, coplanar line, or you can even have an op uh, a 3D cavity, a box, superconducting box, with a qubit suspended inside, coupled through antennas to the field inside the cavity. The Q factors have increased tremendously during the last years, and now you have cavities which can have a photon lifetime of the order of one millisecond, Q factor of the order of 10 to the nine. So you see the strong analogy the big difference is that the coupling of these superconducting devices is much bigger than for the Rydberg atoms because these are quasi-macroscopic electric, quasi electric dipoles. So what kind of physics can we do with that? And now I go to the second uh, part, which is analyzing a very simple model. As I told you, many of these experiments can be discussed by assuming that you have a two-level system, which you can call a spin, coupled to a harmonic oscillator. And uh, with Jean-Michel Raymond, we, we, we wrote a book in which we discussed uh, this physics using this model, taking examples from cavity QD and ion trap physics. So you see here the two systems, the spin, which is a two-level system, the oscillator, which is either a photon or a phonon system with the 0, 1, 2, 3 state, and the coupling omega between them describes the rate at which the spin can exchange photons or phonons with with uh, the oscillator. And uh, you see that this applies very well to the two uh, system, kind of system I have been discussing. 
in the case of uh, photons in a cavity, the oscillator is, of course, the photon field. And the two-level system is a system consisting in two the, the, the atoms being either in the upper or in the lower state of the transition. So, and, and the coupling is just the process by which uh, the, the atomic system absorbs or emits a photon while flipping from one state to the other. In the case of ions, and this is applied as well to cavity QED and to circuit QED. In the case of ion trap physics, the spin is represented by the two internal states of an ion, is a ground state and a metastable excited state, or two ground states. And uh, the, the oscillator is, of course, a vibration, mechanical vibration of the ion in the trap. And the coupling is provided by a laser on a sideband, which at the same time flip the internal state and adds or subtract a quantum of vibration. And the Hamiltonian describing this is quite similar to the one which described cavity QED. So you see here uh, the, how it works in the case of what we call the strong coupling. Strong coupling means that the frequency omega which describes the rate at which the two systems exchange overcomes all the other rates, the relaxation rate and so on. And so we can, to first approximation, forget about the coupling to the environment and consider the spin and the oscillator as strongly coupled to each other. I have represented here the energy levels. If the atom is in level G, you have a ladder of states with 0, 1, 2, 3 uh, photons. If it is in state E, you have a ladder with 0, 1, 2, 3 photons. And you see that the level G1 and E0 on one side, G2 and E1, G3 and E2, are either degenerate or nearly de degenerate depending upon whether you are exactly at resonance or not. When you take the coupling into account, this degeneracy is lifted and you get a doublet for e in each manifold. In the first excited manifold, the, the coupling is proportional, is equal to omega, the, the uh, fundamental coupling constant. It becomes omega square root of two in the second manifold, omega square root of three in the third manifold and so on. This square root represents just the matrix element of the operator which creates or annihilates one photon in the cavity. So if you prepare the, and, and you see that these states, which are linear combination of G, N, and E, N minus one, are called dress states. They are the states, the energy eigenstate of the coupled system atom plus field. If you introduce the system by exciting the atom in state E with zero photon, you see that we have an oscillation between E0 and G1 due to the coupling. This is called the Rabi oscillation. And the splitting between the two states is called the Rabi splitting, Rabi splitting. And so you can observe this either in an experiment in the time domain by looking at the probability for the atom to be in state E as a function of time, or in the frequency domain by performing the spectroscopy of this atom plus cavity system. So these two uh, kind of experiments are kind of Fourier transform of each other, and they have been done in cavity QED and in circuit QED. And you see that in circuit QED, the coupling at resonance is huge. It is of the order of tens of megahertz. It is about 1,000 times larger than what it is in cavity QED. I will now discuss a little bit the radio oscillation and uh, what happens if you prepare uh, the qubit in state E with n photons in the cavity. So it's a very special case, and I just insist on the fact that a Fox state is not a natural state. Usually, when you look, take a natural field, it is, a, it is in a coherent state, which is a superposition of n states. But if you can prepare an n state, you see that preparing the atom in E with n photons is preparing a superposition of the two dry state plus n and minus n. And you can look at this experiment as a kind of quantum interference experiment. You prepare a system which is in a superposition of the two states plus n and minus n, and at a later time, you measure, find the system in state E, amounts to measuring the probability for the system to be in a combined state plus n plus minus n. And so you can look at this as a kind of Max Zender interferometer. You prepare the system, it splits into two eigenstates, and then you measure something which is a recombination of the two eigenstates. Of course, it's a very simple problem in, in quantum physics. The system evolves as a linear superposition of plus n and minus n. And when you reproject on one state, 
like the state E, you find an amplitude which is cosine of omega square root of n plus one, and on the other state sine. And you see now that the evolution of this system leads you naturally to entanglement. You start with E n, and after some time you have a superposition of E n and G n plus one, which is a non-separable entangled state. If the atom leaves the cavity, you have an entanglement between non-local entanglement between the atom and the cavity is the field left behind. Uh, how can you measure, how can you observe that? The first thing you have to do is to prepare an end state. And I show you here how it has been done in circuit QED. You start by the qubit in state E and the cavity is a, the, the RF field with zero photon. So you have to prepare the system in this state. Then you apply a rabbit pulse you couple the cavity with the field for a time t such that omega t is equal to pi. So the system goes from E0 to G1. And so at, the, at this point, you have just one photon in the cavity, but the atom is in state G. Then you pump the atom back, the, the qubit back into state E by applying a microwave which acts only on the qubit and not on the field. And now you are in state E1. At that point, you couple again the qubit to the field now for a time which is shorter because you want omega square root of 2t being equal to pi, and you end up with a state G2. And you can go on and you can pump photons one by one inside your cavity. Once you have done that, if you want to test that you have a, a given photon number, what you do is that you use the same qubit to do a radio oscillation. And so you let the system evolve with the feed for a given time, and you see that depending upon the photon number that you have in the cavity, you get a radio oscillation frequency omega, omega square root of two, omega square root of three, two omega, and so on. And you see that indeed these frequencies obey, obey to, to the rules that you expect. This has been done in circuit QED, and also similar experiments have been done in ion traps in the, in, in, in the group of, of Bay Wyman. So you see that you can prepare the, these non-classical Fox states and study how they are coupled to the field in the cavity. Uh, Another interesting point is to study radio oscillation in a coherent field, which is a natural way uh, in which radio oscillation occurs generally. You apply a classical field and you look at what happens to the atom. In this case, uh, you, you see that a, a coherent field is in fact a field which is a superposition of different Fox states. And this is basically a consequence of Heisenberg uncertainty relation. If you want the field to have a well-defined phase, which is a classical uh, parameter, you need to have an uncertainty on the photon number. And so the system has to be in a superposition of n states. And in fact, in a current state, the superposition is a superposition which has a Poisson uh, law. So you start with this and you inject an atom in state E. Now you have to superpose the various Rabi frequencies. And you see a system evolves now as a superposition of state EN and GN plus one with different N values according to this Poisson distribution. If the field is large, the dispersion around very large N value is very small. The Poisson distribution is peaked at a very well defined frequency. And so you can, in fact, replace in the argument of the cosine N by the average value. And you get a radio oscillation, which is going on forever, which is what you expect from a classical field. But the interesting situation is what happens if the field is small. <coughs> if you have only a few photons, then omega, omega square root of two, omega square root of three, beat with each other. And these incommensurate frequencies result in the fact that the radio oscillation collapses when they get out of phase with each other. So this collapse is very easy to understand. But what is very surprising at first sight is that after some time, the oscillation revives. And it's called the revival of the radio oscillation. And you see here a simulation, a calculation showing what happens if you have on the average 25 photon in your current field. These collapse and revivals have been observed experimentally in the three systems that I have been discussing. You see here what the kind of revivals you see in circuit QED, the revivals observed in, in ion traps, again in the group of Dave, and the similar signals that we observed in cavity QED about 20 years ago. So the collapse is due to the dispersion of Rabi frequencies. The revivals are related to periodic entanglement and disentanglement between the atom and the field. And I just show it here on the next slide. 
you see what you prepare when you excite the atom in state E is a linear superposition of atoms that being in the eigen state E plus IG and E minus IG. And if the photon number is very large, the atom and the field they evolve independently. The field is just classical, and you just look at the beating between these two states, and you get the, Rabi, the classical Rabi oscillation. But what happens if the photon number is small, if the field is mesoscopic? I, I have plotted here uh, this big arrow with this fuzzy ball represents the co a coherent field in phase space. It has a well-defined phase, but a, big, a small fuzziness due to the fact that you have uncertainties on the photon number and on the phase. If you couple this to your atom, and the atom is again a superposition of a spin pointing in direction E plus IG and E minus IG, if you couple them and look at what happens, you have a very uh, interesting phenomenon. You see that the field is now perturbed by the atom, and it gets, in fact, a phase shift and the phase shift depends upon which component of the atom you are coupled to. If you are coupled to the component E plus IG, the field is shifted in one direction. If it is coupled to E minus IG, it is shifted in the opposite direction. And since the, the state E is a superposition of the two, you get a superposition of these two states. This kind of state is called the Schrodinger cap for the field. It's a superposition of fields, which quantum superposition of fields in different directions. And you see, as soon as this happens, you see that the radio oscillation collapses. It collapses because the field acts as a kind of witch pass detector. The field can be used as a kind of meter which tells you whether the atom is in the state E plus IG or E minus IG. And since the radio oscillation is nothing but an interference effect, if you have a witch pass information, you lose the interference. And so, in fact, you see that the collapse of this uh, system is due to the entanglement between the atom and the field. Now, if you go on, you see that the system goes like that. At this point, you have a big cap, but you don't see anything here because you see that the, the, the field gives you information about the atom. So you have to wait until the system recombines on the other side, and then the oscillation revives. They revive because at this point, you see that uh, the two parts of the cat are recombined, and so they don't give you any more information about in which state E plus IG or E minus IG is the atom. So I think this kind of signal, uh, which are a signature of atom field entanglement oscillations, is uh, very interesting in the context of, of fundamental physics. At the classical limit, of course, the collapse and the revival times are rejected to infinity, and you don't see them. And uh, these radio revivals are a signature of the cat's quantum coherence. And in recent experiments, we have used these revivals to show that these Schrodinger cats allow us to measure very small variation of microwave feed with a very high precision. Now I go to the non-destructive quantum jumps. So you see that if you use a, a non-destructive way to measure the field in the cavity, what you expect to see when the field decays due to relaxation processes is a kind of staircase decrease. Because the photon number can decrease only by discrete steps. And this is what we observe in our experiment. You see here a typical example where the photon decreases from 4 to 3 to 2 to 1 to 0 photon. How does it work? I don't have time to discuss in details. But what we do now is that we send across the cavity atoms which are slightly off resonant. The atoms do not match the frequency of the, atom, of the, the field in the cavity. So the atoms cannot absorb or emit photons. And this is the reason why it is non destructive for the light. The light cannot be, the photon number cannot be changed. But the, atom, the atoms undergo light shifts. Their energy levels are slightly displaced. And if you can measure these light shifts, they are proportional to the intensity that is to the photon number. So the photons are non, not destroyed, but uh, they can, the, the, the night shift can be used to count the photons. Of course, you have to do this very fast. You have to be able to measure the light shift before the photon number decays due to relaxation, so you need very good cavity. And when the photon number changes because of relaxation, you see the light shift changing suddenly, and you see the quantum jump. So I, I just 
remind this to remind you this to show that there is a, a strong parallelism similarity between what is being done with ions and with fields. On this slide, I just show you uh, the light, uh, why you have a light shift. You see, uh, these are the dressed levels in the manifold plus n minus n as a function of the detuning between the atom and the cavity. At resonance, you have the splitting omega root of n. And if you go away from resonance, the levels uh, evolve according to the branch of a hyperbola. And you see, if you are far from resonance, there is a small distance between the asymptote and the level. And this distance that you can write here can be developed in power of omega over delta. And you find that the shift is proportional to n. You have a shift proportional to the photon number and to the square of the coupling and inversely proportional to the detuning. And if you accumulate this shift during time t, during the time the atom crosses the cavity, you get a phase shift of the atomic uh, wave function, which is proportional to n, and the phase shift per photon can be very large. So you see what happens now if you are off resonance. You look the energy levels again. If the atom is in state G, you have G0, G1, G2, you have one ladder. If the atom is in excited state E, you have E0, E1, E2. And you see that you have a slight now, a slight uh, mismatch between G1 and E0, G2, and E1 due to the detuning. In black, you see the arrows corresponding to the transition if you don't take the coupling into account. So all these transitions are degenerate. But if you take the coupling into account, you have the red arrows, and you see that depending upon the photon number, the shift increases proportionally to n. And you can measure this light shift, for instance, by performing Ramsey spectroscopy. You see here one of the first results where you see that uh, you can separate the transition corresponding to 0, 1, 2, 3 photons. And uh, the single photon shifts are of the order of 3 kilohertz in our case. And if you are able to measure this shift as the field decays, you see this quantum jumps, you see how the field decays suddenly when photons are lost in the cavity. Similar experiments have been done with in circuit QED. You see here the spectroscopy of a qubit inside a high Q uh, microwave cavity. And you see now that the spectroscopy shows very well separated discrete peaks. This is the transition frequency if you have zero photon in the cavity, this is with one photon, with two photons. And so you see now that the shift is of the order of seven, seven megahertz per photon. And these huge shifts are used to develop quantum information <coughs> procedures. You can see if you tune your RF at this frequency, uh, you see that you will flip your qubit only if there is zero photon in the cavity. At this frequency, you will tune your qubit only if there is one photon in the cavity. So you can realize conditional gates in which the, what happens to the atom depends upon the number of photons in the cavity. And this number of photons can be controlled by another qubit. So you see that you can use this kind of uh, system to realize quantum gates. Uh, and this is what part, part of the game of quantum information. I want here to talk about an experiment that we did recently in which we use this light shift in a slightly different way and in which we can, in fact, use the light shift to project the photon number in the cavity with one single atom. Just a measurement on a single atom will allow us to filter out one given photon number out of the Poisson distribution that we have at the beginning. So at the beginning, we have a field which has different photon numbers because it's a coherent state. And we send one atom, and we ask the question, for instance, are there four photons in the cavity or not? So does the cavity contain a given number of photons? This amounts to measuring the projector on this photon number. And this projector is an observable which, which has the eigenvalue 1 if there is n0 photon, and 0 if there is any other number of photons in the cavity. How do we do it with a single atom? We perform high resolution spectroscopy of the atom cavity system, which resolves in one shot the single photon light shift. And I show you here how it works. You see in red the two levels, 51 and 50 uh, circular states, which uh, are nearly resonant with the cavity field, with a small detuning delta. And in blue, you see the level 52C, which is a 
just the upper state and the 52 C level is not shifted because the transition in the other manifold are very far off resonance with the cavity field. So the cavity photon shifts the level 51 C but not 52 C. And uh, you see that the transition between the level 52 and 51 is shifted by, due to the shift of the 51 level by an amount which is proportional to the photon number in the cavity. So if you look at the spectrum, you see the spectrum is made of equidistant lines depending upon the number of photons that you have in the cavity. So assume now that you shine a microwave which is at this frequency. This microwave will be able to flip the atom from 52 to 51 only if there are, in this case, two photons in the cavity. If the microwave is properly tuned, the atom preterm in 52C would be transferred to 51 only if there are a given number in the cavity. But of course, you need to have a very long interrogation time because you don't want this line to over, uh, flow over the other state. And for that, you need high resolution. And we had to modify our setup. We could not use our setup with Redberg atoms flying at room velocity because they were going too fast and this line was too wide. So we use a modified setup which has been uh, built by Sebastian Glaze in our lab, which uh, starts from a cold atom knot. We span the atom up, and the atom crosses the cavity very slowly, and we perform all the preparation of circular states and the circularization, uh, which I will take about in a moment, inside the cavity. And the interaction time now becomes long enough for this spectroscopy to work out. And you see that now, if you tune the radio frequency, you see that you can separate the peaks corresponding to 0, 1, 2, 3, and these experiments are performed just with a single atom. So what we do next is uh, uh, the following experiment. We want first to prepare a given photon number and then analyze it and make sure that we have this photon number. So the same atom should at the same time filter out a given number and then using radio oscillation to verify that we have only a single frequency in the radio oscillation. So this is done by uh, the following sequence of events. During some time we apply the microwave which has the right frequency. Then we switch off this microwave and put in resonance the atom in the cavity. We wait for some time and after some time we increase suddenly uh, the detuning so that we freeze the evolution and we find out whether the atom is in one state or the other. So you, you use the microwave filter and then you perform radio oscillation. With one at the same atom is used for both things. Of course, we have to repeat because we want to change the interrogation time. And you see the result, the radio oscillation corresponding to the filtering of zero, one, two, three, four photons. These are results uh, in the PhD of Frederick Asselmat. And uh, it shows that you can really use this microwave as a tool to, to carve out, out of a field, a given photon number. When we did that, we learned that uh, this idea has been uh, recently generalized in circuit QED. If you use multiple microwave frequencies, you can not only prepare a Fox state, but you can prepare an arbitrary superposition of Fox states. So you can really use this as a way to tailor a non-classical state in the cavity. Now, very quickly, Photonic Schrodinger cats in cavity QED. Uh, what, is it? what are we talking about? What we want to do now is to prepare a non-classical state, the superposition of two uh, classical states in a way different from the one I discussed before, not by a resonant radio oscillation, but by a dispersive effect when you are out of resonance between the atom and the cavity. So you see what happens. You send across the cavity a single atom. <coughs> this atom undergoes an energy shift when it crosses the cavity. This energy shift changes its potential energy in the cavity, and so it must change also its kinetic energy. And we, the question we ask is where is this energy coming from? If you have n photons, the energy is changed by an amount proportional to n, and this energy change can come only from a change in the energy of the field, because you need energy conservation. Since the photon number cannot change, the only thing which can change is the frequency of each photon and the frequency of each photon changes if you have n photon by this amount, and these two quantities have to be equal. So in fact, this slide shows, in fact, that 
the change in the frequency of the atom and the change of frequency of the field are reciprocal effects, uh, back action of one system and the other. And uh, you see immediately that during the time the atom crosses the cavity, the phase which is accumulated by the field changes by an amount which can be large. And moreover, this phase shift depends upon the state in which the atom is. So you have a shift which can be plus or minus pi over two, depending upon the atom is in state E or G. And of course, if you send the atom in a superposition of E and G, you will prepare the field in a superposition of the two phases. And this is what we show here in, in, in this sketch, which shows how we do the experiment. We start by having a coherent field in the cavity. So again, an arrow with a small fuzziness. We send one atom. The atom is prepared in a superposition of the state ENG, crosses the cavity. After cavity crossing, we have a superposition of the atom in E with one phase, in atom in G with the other phase. And at this point, if we measure the atom, of course, we will find uh, the field with one phase or the other. So the trick we apply is to have the atom cross again a microwave which mixes E and G. And in the end, there's one or two lines of calculation, detecting the atom after the second pulse projects the field into one cat or the other, depending upon whether you find the atom in state E or G, you prepare the cat with a plus or with a minus superposition. So we did that. And after that, we have to measure, of course. And in order to measure, we send other atoms. And for, with this atom, we reconstruct the field. And I don't have time to discuss that, but this is called uh, state tomography. What we do is that we displace the field in its phase space by different angles, and we perform QND measurement on all these copies. And we get what we call the Wigner function of the field. You see here these two peaks of the Wigner function correspond to the two coherent state of the opposite phases. And you have fringes in the middle, which describe the coherent nature, which are a signature of the fact that we are in a superposition state. These fringes are equivalent to the fringes you see in the revival signal of the radio oscillation. You see here what we call an even cut with a plus sign. Here you have an odd cut with a minus sign, just change the phases of the fringes. And if you don't distinguish between E and G, and you detect without discriminating the final state, you have a superposition of the two, and you have now what is called a statistical mixture. You lose the coherence. And so we did these experiments about 10 years ago. Similar experiments have been done in circuit QED, and you see various examples of CAT observed by the group of uh, Rob Schellkopf in Yale, and similar CATs have been observed by the group of John Martin UCSB. So now I would like to uh, go to the last part of this talk and give you an example of Hamilton engineering. I, I would like to describe a quantum Zeno experiment that we perform with uh, Rydberg atoms. And uh, I remind you that uh, what uh, quantum Zeno, the quantum Zeno effect is about. If you have a system which evolves according to a coherent quantum process, and if you measure a non-degenerate observable of this uh, system, and if you measure it periodically at a very fast rate, you freeze the system evolution. Because each time you make a measurement, you reproject it with a high probability to the initial state. This is what you do when you do it on a non-degenerate observable. But if you now measure an observable which has a degenerate subspace, the same kind of argument shows that you can restrict the evolution to a subspace corresponding to one eigenvalue. The system is no longer able to jump from one eigenvalue, degenerate eigenvalue, to another one. In other words, by making the measurement, you provide a kind of barrier which restricts the evolution of the system into a small subspace. So we did that with Rydberg atoms. And uh, now we don't have a cavity anymore. We just have one atom which we prepare into a circular state. And for that, I'll just show you here how we do it. If you apply, you see here two manifolds, n equal 50 and n equal 51. In each of these, when you apply an electric field to the atom, by Stark effect, you lift the degeneracy of all these states in the manifold, and the levels organize themselves according to a triangular shape. You see here, you have uh, n squared state, 2,500 states, 
according to the m value, which is a projection of the angular momentum along the electric field, this is m equals 0, m equals 1, m equals 2. And for each m value, you have a high degeneracy until you get to the highest end state, which has only one possibility. And so at the tip of this triangle, you have the circular state you want to reach. How do we prepare the circular state? A laser starts from the ground state, excites an intermediate state, then a second laser brings you to a low angular momentum state at the, at the bottom of this triangle. And now we have to go from this state to that one. And for that, we have the atom absorbing circularly polarized photons of radio frequency. And they go continuously along this line until you reach a circular state. To do that, you have here the configuration, you have the atomic beam, lasers which excite the atoms, and the electric field which is applied here. The cavity is just here, two electrodes which allow us to apply electric fields, but they, they are no longer in resonance with the atoms. Another ingredient here is the fact that you can apply a microwave connecting any of these states, this level to the upper manifold. And the frequency of this microwave depends upon the state you are in here because the Stark effects are different in two manifolds. So this microwave is a probe which allows you to find out in which state along this chain of state the system is at a given time. Because in the end, you ionize and you detect. So let me summarize what we are doing. We start with a Rydberg atom in zero electric field. We apply an electric field, we just uh, spans out the energy levels. Then we apply a laser which excites you here. And then we apply a radio frequency field which brings you into the circular state. Once you are in the circular state, what can you do? You can apply again radio frequency field. If the fields are circular, you provide sigma plus, the only transition you can excite are the blue ones. If the field is sigma minus, they are the yellow ones. So if you have a circularly polarized state in sigma plus, you can forget about the yellow lines, and the system can only follow this route. And if you start from here, the only way to go is to go again along the lower side of the triangle. If you start from here, you see that in fact now you are restricted to this ladder of states, which is quite equivalent to the energy levels of a large angular momentum. In fact, it has all the dynamics and the evolution of an angular momentum. So in fact, we prepare here a large angular momentum with which we are working. And an angular momentum evolves on a generalized block sphere. So we can look at all the energy levels here and all the states as represented on this block sphere in the same way as we were looking at the field state as evolving in the plane, in the final plane, complex plane. So for instance, if you start from a circular state and if you apply the radio frequency field circularly polarized, what you will get is this evolution. Your spin is going around and up and down around the ladder. These states are called spin coherent states. And you see that as soon as you reach, you, you go out of the North Pole, they become superpositions of angular momentum states in the same way as a coherent state of the field is superposition of n states. So they are called spin coherent states. And you see that you can observe this rotation. If you measure the probability to be in the upper state as a function of time, you see this success. you can observe more than 20 rotation. And this is the way we prepare the circular state. You just stop at this point or at this point, and you are in a circular state. And this has, this has been published recently. So now, what do you do if you want to observe quantum xenodynamics. You do exactly the same experiment, but you add an ingredient. You add a microwave, which will tell you whether the atom has reached a given ladder in this state. For instance, here is the first ladder. And if you do that, you see what will happen is that the system will be unable to go below. And instead of rotating, it will undergo this kind of a motion. And it means that at the time when the state reaches the boundary, in fact, it, get, it overcomes a, a pile phase sh shift of the wave function, and it becomes a superposition of spin states pointing in two different directions at once. And this is what we call a Schrodinger cat of the angular momentum. It's an angular momentum which at the same time points in two directions. 
and we, uh, this is a simulation where you see exactly how this works or how this happens. You see, when it reaches the boundary here, another component appears on the other side, and you have in the Wigner function large uh, fringes. So this was a simulation done before we did the experiment, but you see uh, now the principle of the experiment, again, the same setup. The first stage, we prepare the circular stage. The circular state, we let it evolve, and, but we apply this Zeno microwave, which stops the system here. And another way to interpret it is to say that this measurement opens a gap in the ladder of states, and though the system is prevented from going below, and it evolves only in the restricted subspace. Then we apply a probe microwave to find out in which state we are at a given time, and we change, we ionize to detect the signal, and we resume for different k values. So you see the evolution for a free rotation. In the case where we don't have the zero effect, you see that the probability to be in the upper state decreases, and then the probability to be in the lower state increases as a function of time. If you do it now by confining by QZD, you find that the probability to be in the upper state will bounce back when the atoms come back to the upper state. And finally, what we did is to reconstruct fully the spin state at the inversion time. So we, we, do, it, we do a reconstruction. That is, once we have attained this state, we, we rotate it and we perform measurement of the probability to be in different states. And from that, we can, using uh, max-like uh, ev evaluation methods, we can reconstruct the full Wigner function. And you see uh, the result of the experiment and of numerical simulation, which shows that we are indeed able to prepare this kind of quantum superposition of coherent state with opposite azimuthal phases. And you see this kind of state has narrow fringes. And these narrow fringes are very sensitive to perturbations. And Jean-Michel in his talk tomorrow will show how these narrow fringes can be used to measure a very small electric field with a high precision. So I think it was time to, to finish now. And I will just conclude by saying that what, of course, one application of all this is trying to uh, learn how a quantum computer will work. So you can use this manipulation of real or artificial atoms for quantum computer research. On the left, you have an ion trap. I took this picture from the University of Maryland from uh, Chris Monroe's lab. And on the other side, a picture taken from the superconducting lab of uh, John Martinis. We have two talks about ion traps. Unfortunately, and we don't have any talk on superconducting qubits here, but as you said, we have seen the, the principle of the experiment are quite similar. I just want also to say that these non-classical states are used now in quantum metrology, and these non-classical states are very fragile, so they are subjected to decoherence, and these topics will be uh, discussed by uh, Luis Davinovich in his talk about decoherence and in the talk of Jean-Michel uh, about metrology. And finally, uh, Jean-Michel will talk about uh, using these circular Rydberg atoms to build a quantum simulator in which a chain of these atoms will, be, will have a, a, a kind of Taylor, Taylorable interaction between them and could be used to simulate situations uh, which uh, can be of theoretical and practical interest. So I think I have used up my time and we'll stop here and thank you. I don't think they have that for the time being. Uh, of course, 
in, in this experiment, the atoms were crossing and going above uh, and detected outside. In, in the ultimate version, the atoms will be at the, at the top of the trajectory inside and then being detected inside the cavity, but I don't, uh, it's not yet the case. So, uh, and it might explain also why there is not a big win on the, on the width of this design because of the kind of effects you're talking about. So. Further questions? Comments? Oh, if not, thanks, Serge, again. Okay.